You're listening to Docs Outside the Box, episode 49, with creator of Feminem, Dr. Dara Cass. Welcome to Docs Outside the Box podcast. This is your official show, looking inside the minds of cutting edge and innovative doctors. Think you'll find these stories in any medical textbook? Sorry, you're getting real live insight from men and women pushing the envelope beyond medicine. Ordinary doctors doing extraordinary things. Let's start now with your host, Dr. Nee Darko. This episode is brought to you by Set for Life Insurance. Protect yourself against life setbacks with Set for Life Insurance. Set for Life Insurance gets you disability and life insurance at a reduced cost with their exclusive discounts. Now, that's why I use them. Visit www.setforlifeinsurance.com and tell them Dr. Darko sent you. What's good, everyone? This is Dr. Nee Darko. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Docs Outside the Box, where we keep it 100. (laughs) On this episode, you're going to get a chance to hear from one person who I think is probably one of the leading voices for the advancement of women in medicine. Um, Whether you call her an advocate, a change agent, agent of change, whatever you want to use, a social activist, Dr. Dara Cass is my next guest, and she is passionate about creating an environment where women, particularly women in emergency medicine, can act as champions for one another. We're talking specifically about her organization called FEMNM. Um, It's an organization that makes it very easy for women physicians throughout the United States and even across the world in emergency medicine to connect with each other. On their website, it says, quote, it's an open access resource where we discuss, discover and affect the journey of women working in emergency medicine, end quotes. So FEMNM has grown from, in essence, a passion project for Dr. Dara Cass to an organization that, in essence, prides itself on mentorship as well as professional development for women in emergency medicine. And this is this is accomplished on so many different levels, I must say. Digitally, obviously, the website, which is 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 an amazing website, it has so many different facets to it. For example, there's blogs on the website where you can find anything from work-life balance to challenges within the workplace to pay disparities, how you handle that. There's job postings on the website. And there's also even something that I think is really cool. There's a speakers bureau on the website. So if event organizers, conference planners want to have female speakers within specific specialties or topics, they can easily find them through the speakers bureau and even find video of them speaking. And then most recently, the website launched a podcast, which is a phenomenal podcast. You should go ha- go out and check it out. You can find it on the website, and it's available on Apple Podcasts as well as Google Play. And then most recently, not, not digitally, but most recently on a live level, Feminem recently had, and it's coming off the highly successful Feminem Idea Exchange, otherwise known as FIX 2017. And this was, in essence, a conference where people from all over the world Women, men in emergency medicine came together to learn from each other, to conference with each other, to network with each other. There was also workshops which covered everything from personal finance to amplifying your amplifying your voice with social media to even getting over imposter syndrome. It was great. So I think after hearing this podcast, you'll find that Dr. Cass is very engaging. She's extremely dynamic. She's energetic, truly someone who cares about making a difference in the world, making the world a better place. And I think that deserves to be highlighted. So things that you're going to pick up in this episode are what inspires her to be a physician. You're going to learn about her experiences at a large urban hospital in Brooklyn, New York, and what she learned from that experience. You're going to also hear about the origin of Feminem and what it's like to create something and get buy-in. I think you all, if you love this show, you really can really identify with that concept of creating something, doing something that's outside of the box, and then not only just going from concept, but going to proof of concept and getting people to really understand where you're coming from and jump on in. You're also going to learn ways in which feminine, fem and M can be more inclusive. She answers some tough questions about feminine and, you know, how can it be everything to everybody? And is that even too much to ask from an organization. So I, we, we kept it 100 and I think she, I threw a tough question at her and she did a really good job in answering it. 
And then obviously you're going to hear about how she answers hashtag I'm not just a doc. So I think this is a good one. I think you all are going to enjoy this one. I think you're all going to enjoy how open she is, how passionate she is about this project. And I think she's also going to provide some inspiration to you all who are sitting on the fence and not sure if you have um, or if anybody will believe in your product, if anybody will believe in your project or even your concept. This is really the episode for you. So without further ado, I present Dr. Dara Cass. Dara Cass, welcome to Docs Outside the Box. How you doing? How you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Been looking forward to talking to you for some time. And, um, you know, when I reached out to you, I didn't think that uh, you would actually want to be on the show, but it's a, it really is, um, you know, says something about just putting things out there and hoping that things turn out right. So thank you so much, so much for being on the show. It's funny because when you reached out to me, I was like, oh my God, he finally knows who I am. <laughs> you know, it's funny how these things work, right? Like I, you know, you watch people from afar, you know, and with this job where you're trying to find guests all the time, you end up stalking people, right? And you're like, oh, this person will never come on the show. And then lo and behold, I guess you kind of thought the same thing in terms of, you know, when would I have you on the show? But eh, there goes to the listeners. If you want something, go ahead and get, go ahead and go for it. So if, and if you dream it, it might come true. <laughs> right, right, right. And this is a dream come true. So, so look, like I, I am really excited to have you on the show because there's a lot that we're going to talk about. But before we get, you know, too far into uh, in depth about feminine, which is phenomenal and what you're doing with it, tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up, med school, all of that. So I'm a girl from Brooklyn and I still Brooklyn? live in Brooklyn. <laughs> I, I, we're, I, in Brooklyn. I, we're in Brooklyn. I grew up in what I call real Brooklyn, uh, which is Sheepshead Bay, the south of Brooklyn. It's where everybody's parents grew up. That is a generation above me who mm. moved out of Brooklyn. I moved out for a brief period of time for college uh, and then came back actually for medical school. So I went to SUNY Downstate for medical school, which is a state school. And I went there because I, aside from the fact that it was one of the only schools I got into, <laughs> which is ultimately hey, most you people's You get in where you fit in though, right? right? God gives you what you need. Mm-hmm. So- I got into downstate and um, I wanted to be an emergency medicine doctor actually since I was a child. My mom was, uh, my mom was an emergency medicine nurse Ah. and she was a nurse at the hospital that I was born at. And uh, the hospital that I was born at is called Brookdale university hospital, which is real Brooklyn. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) More than even my real Brooklyn. And so she was a nurse wait, in the wait, ER when because there's right. wait because there's so many different ways you can describe Brooklyn. There's real Brooklyn, there's Brooklyn, there's gentrified Brooklyn. Like which one are we talking about? Right. So I was born in real real Brooklyn. I moved to regular Brooklyn and now I live I in gentrified you. Okay. Brooklyn. I, thank you very much for clarifying that. <laughs> it's kind of the American gotcha. dream. <laughs> so anyway, so I um so she was she was working in the ER and when I was a kid and she would tell me stories of all the things she would see in this very inner city, very urban emergency department. And I thought it was amazing. Uh, you know, hands getting blown up from firecrackers and people getting shot and heart attacks and the team coming together to save lives. So when I got into medical school, I'd already established that I was going to be an emergency medicine doctor. And, you know, I was the only family that validated that as a viable career because lots of people who are interested in emergency medicine, their parents were surgeons if they were doctors or pediatricians, and they didn't necessarily think Mm -hmm. that was like a real job. But my mom had worked in the ER and she knew that it was a great job. And so she was like, that makes sense. Um, so I went to Downstate, which was a fantastic place to learn emergency medicine. It's a very busy, busy, busy program. Yeah, I established myself like from day one, hour one. I was like, I'm here to be an ER doctor. I'll go through the medical school part of it. And then I'm going to (laughs) stay and do your residency. And they were like, we have no idea who this chick is, but she's not going away. So we're going to keep her. (laughs) It's pretty much a valid reason. So um, so I stayed there for residency, actually. Uh, And I did my residency at Kings County Hospital, which was um, the the, one of the most uh, interesting, emotionally validating, incredible experiences in my life. Uh, it was eight years of what I felt like was a family and it was amazing. And then I left after graduation and I went to a hospital completely different. It was a very different patient demographic. It was a different environment on an island called Staten, Staten Island. <laughs> Strong. Staten Island. Okay. All right. Strong Island is Long Island. And there's yeah, Staten that's Island. true. So and Staten Island is Shaolin. Oh, my bad. Right. Shaolin. Okay. Exactly. So Wu-Tang, what's up? Mm-hmm. So uh, Staten Island for me was a very different experience clinically. Um, and it was a different patient population. And it got to 
I got to see and treat patients actually look more like me, which had, didn't happen at Kings County. There was a very, it was a very different experience. I mean, ultimately I was there for four or five years and then I left to go where I am now, which is at NYU, um, which is closer to my house and gave me other opportunities academically to work at a medical school and to do curriculum development. And ultimately I think a lot of the opportunities that allowed me to create Feminem and where we are now. Well, since you opened the door to Feminem then, okay. So tell us about Feminem. What exactly is it? How did you come up with the idea? I mean, I think this is really fascinating to create something like this and for it to become like this huge, um, um, you know, following. I think following is too, too loose of a term. I mean, it's, I don't even know how to, you take it from there. You you describe okay. it. It's amazing. So Feminem at, at its core, at its beginning, was just a way to collect like to create a space for mostly women, but really women in emergency medicine to feel like they could go when they had a question or a need. So it really started, I had done a lot of stuff over the first eight years of my career, let's say, or seven years, whatever it was, in education and residency in technology. So asynchronous education, um, webcasts, uh, websites, and some blogs and Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, we had done all this technology and innovation on education, but when it came to our career development as physicians, we were on islands, right? So if you were like me, a young woman going through the life cycle of being a 30 to 35 year old female and being a doctor. So I was married, I was having kids, I was developing my career. I was looking for mentors. I was looking for peers and sponsors and everything. You know, I was a pretty good connector, so I started developing those answers for myself, but other people weren't necessarily as, you know, outgoing mm -hmm. or as extroverted or as easily connected. And so I watched them ask me questions that I had settled or I had settled publicly, you know. I, I was very public about my parental leave, you know, my maternity leave. When I needed a lactation room, I made sure that I got one, you know. And so about Seven years into, after I graduated from residency, I was like, there has to be a better way to solve this problem, to get these people together. Now, now, when you talk about that, the lactation room and making sure that you take your leave, like that, that still is, I wouldn't say taboo, but it's something that a lot of women, I think, have a hard time really championing. Like, did you get any feedback and, or any pushback actually when you did that? Or were you by yourself when you did that? Or was it like a group of, of y'all who said, look, we're taking this and this is how we're going to go. Right. So this is a, so this singular example is a perfect example of anything when you are the underrepresented person or the person who is a minority or whatever it is. Right. So when you're the person who needs something, it is very hard to ask for it. Right. When you're asking for something from a system, That's I a am the perfect person to do that because I don't give a fuck. Right. So at the end of the day, I think I, the term is zero fuck section. I, I give less than zero fucks now. So I was relatively unapologetic when I asked for things within reason. I I wasn't rude about it mostly, but I was, I was really empowered to be the person that was an agent of change at that time when other people were more vulnerable than me. And, you know, it has to do with some circumstances and a lot of privilege, right? I was in an environment where I felt confident in my skills. I might confident in my placement. I wasn't worrying about getting fired. If I got fired, I would solve that problem again. I live in a high density city with a lot of emergency medicine jobs. I worked for somebody that was willing to listen to what I had to say. I'm married to a partner that was willing to stand up with me for the things I needed. And so, yes, I got a lot of pushback, right? But I didn't care and it didn't affect me. And so if they pushed me back, I pushed back again. And, you know, it's really hard for somebody to give you a true tangible reason why women shouldn't give it a, be given a safe, clean place to pump that's not a bathroom, right? They can't solve it for you. But if you bring them solutions, they're pretty okay with seeing them through a lot of times. So having that said, since I had solved a lot of these problems for myself, I wanted to make I wanted to create this space that would help others see the solutions, find each other, find mentors and sponsors. And so it really came down to starting a website. So the whole thing was that um, we had done a lot of newsletters in emergency medicine in all of our women's groups. And people had written articles that I thought were important and fascinating about you know, anything from, you know, gender bias in promotion to salary discrepancies to postpartum depression. And after you read the article, you were like, this is powerful. And then it's like in somebody's email inbox. So, this, so, right? so Nobody... basically you guys are all like different islands, so to speak, at this point exactly. prior to feminine, Silos. right? You guys are just separate. Exactly. Islands. Okay. All right. So every, every major national organization had a women's group, 
right? Just like there's a group for, you know, interest in ultrasound or whatever it is, like each of the groups existed and they wrote newsletters and they had listservs, but they were not connected and there was nowhere for them to have historical memory, right? So I found out, you know, I basically said, I want to create a website and I was lucky enough to have uh, the ability to back it myself and to have a resident who was a web designer. (laughs) So (laughs) it's all about like life is literally about who you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of my residents was a web designer in his previous career. And I said, how much would you charge me to build a website that's basically going to serve women in emergency medicine? And he charged me the friends and family rate. And it was incredible. You know? I love it. And so and I didn't want it to be owned by an institution. And this is the first, um, I think, pearl or whatever I can say is if you're going to be an agent of change as you're doing it. You have to think about who's going to oversee your ability to be that change maker, right? So I knew if I was pushing the envelope for gender and medicine, I was not going to be able to work for the man while I did it, right? So if if a major institution was going to financially back me, anyone, whether it was a national organization or the academic institution I was working at, you know, because I had a lot of offers to partner for this, um, uh, they were going to be able to oversee how I did something. Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. Let's let's take a step back. So you're yeah. saying you're saying that when you were getting ready to make the website for Feminem, a lot of people wanted to partner with you at this point. Yeah. So once I had the idea and I said I want to create this space for women in medicine, and they knew me, they knew that I would make it happen. I got offers from institutions and from organizations to host the website. And this is just you by yourself. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah. So they said, well, we'll host it on our website. And, you know, they were trying to provide me the opportunity to like that their web traffic or whatever it was going to be was going to help me. Right. And I was like, you know what? I really want to do this on my own. I think that for me, the autonomy, right. And the control of the content was so much more important because if it was going to go anywhere, it was going to make somebody uncomfortable, you know, and that meant that it was working. I like it. And so I didn't didn't want somebody to tell me no for the purpose that it made them uncomfortable because it was working. Okay. I like it. That makes a lot of sense. So I said, thank you. I said, yeah. So I said, thanks, but no thanks. Right. I said, this is mine. I'm going to own it. So now, now why did you decide web as opposed to Facebook, Twitter, you know, other various types of uh, social media? So, okay. So uh, social, so I did it all actually. Um, okay. But it had to have a home, right? So the website, the blog was was the core, right, of the of the like you know hub and spoke. And so all I expected to do when I started this was actually host articles on a website about a topic that I thought needed to have permanence. And then through that portal, as people came in and out, they would find each other. That's all I thought it would be. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna you know, we're going to have this website. We're going to put up some old articles from the, from the newsletters that have been out there. We're going to have a Twitter feed and a Facebook group, and we're going to see where the conversation goes. We launched on September 6th, which is my birthday, which I did, you know, kind of so I'd remember. Okay. (laughs) With three kids and a husband and an anniversary. I don't really remember that many dates anymore. (laughs) So I tried to consolidate. Use what works. Use what works. Okay. (laughs) Right. Shortcuts. So um, we launched on my birthday and I immediately, we got like retweeted by champions, which is a next pearl is that if people champion you, the ones that are not underrepresented, the ones are not in the minority, you really have a chance. Hmm. So it was literally, it was the the men of emergency medicine who immediately said, pay attention to this. Hmm. It is important. And I remember that the first time that that was tweeted by guys in England and Australia, it was like, like an hour after we launched this thing. And I was like, oh my God, they believe in us. Like this is going to work. What year was this? 2015. 2015. Okay. And uh, so that was, uh, so that was 2015. And we started with content. We actually loaded the site with a few articles and we immediately started getting content submissions. People had basically been waiting for a platform like this. And some of it was me calling people and saying, you know, you know, that Facebook post you put up, turn it into an article and submit it to Feminem. Like a lot of it was some triggering of people to say, you have something to say. Mm-hmm. Would you say it here? Right. And so we did that. And then we started using the, now that we had the website, we started building things that it seemed like needed to be built by the movement. 
right? And so that goes back to how does it grow? It's totally organic, right? If I had gone in two and a half years ago saying I would be sitting here today on a podcast with my own podcast, my own conference, and all the scores of stuff going on, I would have been like unable to breathe. Now, you know, the we had um, Hala Sabri. Um, yeah. She's with the Physician Moms Group. She, mm-hmm. in essence, said the same thing also, right? It just started off of just putting something out on Facebook. And then next, you know, two years later, she's got conferences. And, you know, when I interviewed her, the same thing came out of her mouth. It, it's really phenomenal. And, and I want to ask you about that. Like, it's how does that feel to, like, create something that kind of has a life of its own? Because, you know, you study medicine, right? You read textbooks, all the techniques, all of these different you know, things that we do in the ER or in other parts of the hospital have all been figured out, you know, in earlier parts of the 1900s and, you know, 2000s, there are all these names. So like, there's really no discovering, right? You're just reading, memorizing, and then you take care of patients. But tell me what it's like to go from that to actually creating something. This is your baby, you know, and um, people are critiquing it, you know, good and for bad. Tell tell us like, what's that like? It's empowering and it's, um, it's scary, both at the same time. So I think that, you know, it is, I am shocked at how many people know about feminine and I am not a shocked easily person. Okay. So from Brooklyn. Right. And I am like the, I am the epitome of a girl from Brooklyn, right? I am like in your face, bombastic. I asked you if there was an explicit rating for this podcast before we started. Like, you know, I don't get surprised by a lot, especially when it comes to impact. Wait, hold on real quick, real quick before mm-hmm. we settle it right now. Brooklyn pizza or like, you know, like oh, Papa- there isn't any other, <laughs> you don't need to finish the set. I love it. I love it. Keep going. Let's go. Let's get back. Let's get back to work. <laughs> right. So, um, so basically, you know, we just had our, so to fast forward for a second and then to bring it where we are now having our second feminine conference and we'll go through a little bit of how we got to here, which goes but by the got, name of fix, right? Right. So mm-hmm. it's the feminine idea exchange right. because we realized that we wanted to have a cool, you know, short name <laughs> and we had hundreds of submissions for speakers and we'll go through that. I, I want to talk about that a little more, but what was amazing was I didn't know half the people that submitted. So when we started mm-hmm. Feminem and we started the, the, the website, everyone that wrote an article, I knew, okay. right. I had asked them for content. I had brought them in. I had invited them to the journey, but we've gotten to the point now where people who are not part of my inner circle and it's a big circle, right. Are, are trying to be, are not trying, are part of the movement and are empowered to be change makers and stuff like that. And so I feel like that's so, that's the invigorating part and also scary because I don't, they don't know me to believe in me, you know, and yet they do. And I don't know what to do with people that I don't know who believe in me. You know, I'm used to convincing people to believe in me. And I'm sure that, that at the same time is scary, but it's also like empowering. Like I built this. Yeah. And they will come, you know, and just right. kind of, you know, and I, I liken it to like my website. Obviously, my website, my podcast is not on the same level as you. It's a false equivalence. I'm not a. I I found I'm, you. So I'm what did that a, say? Right. But, it, you know, like the, just even getting my first couple of guests, like I was like, hey, you want to record on a podcast that doesn't have a website? And, you know, like, I don't even know how to really make this happen. But on the day that we're, we agreed to have this podcast, like. I'll send you how we're going to record. Like, it's phenomenal. It's amazing to like create something. It almost feels like you're like an artist, you know? So, you know, like as you're talking about this and getting excited, I'm getting excited for you because I can, I can, I I understand what you're going through. It's amazing. I'm like a conductor is the way I think about it. Right. Like it's like a, it is like a musical. Like it's like, there's, there's like big parts and small parts and they all require some element of, of curation and attention. And, you know, it's funny because so we did the website, we started having the conversations, and then we had our first controversy, right? Yeah, that's what so I want. Our, yeah, let's hear about that. Come on now. So Docs outside the box okay. to get real. Right. So our first controversy was really that um, there was a conference that had no women speakers. Was and the ER it was an emergency it was an emergency medicine conference that was pretty well publicized. And what happened was that the guy who plan the conference who was actually a friend of mine as soon as he got called out on twitter by somebody outside of america right he was like you know wait i can i can tell you what happened i'm not a bad person and i want to defend myself but i want to do it with feminine right i want them to be the arbiter of was i wrong (laughs) 
right? So we had like kind of established ourselves as like the the safe place <laughs> to talk about gender in medicine, right? Which is like kind of amazing if you think about it, right? So we set this whole thing up and then we had a conversation about women's speakers in emergency medicine and medicine in general. And what really happened was we we actually had like an hour long, we, we did a, it was a, it was, it would have been a podcast then, but it was a Google hangout and we recorded it and we put it out on air. And what we learned from the conversation was, and it happens all the time with bias, right? People that perpetuate unconscious bias are very rarely bad people, mm-hmm. right? They have a set of circumstances that gives them their information and they go along with their information and move forward. So this conference organizer, who's awesome, only wanted speakers that he had heard and he had known and he had vetted himself. And what, so like you said, mainly, mainly men. Well, and not only that, but you said the same thing about your podcast, right? Who's in your inner circle? How many of them look like you? How many of them act like you? How many of them are just like you, right? right. So if you're going to invite people on your podcast, they're generally going to look like you. Now, I'd argue that a podcast by somebody that looks like you was a really good idea, right? But for him, a whole conference of guys that look like him was not a really good idea, if that makes any Mm -hmm. sense. Like there becomes an issue around an entire conference of white men who are speaking really eloquently on important medical topics, but there are more people than that that can speak. But it required him to increase his network. And he was willing to do that, but he didn't know how to do that, right? And so my job was to create the how. And so that's what we did. So we created the Feminine Speakers Bureau which is the only searchable database for women speakers in medicine. Okay. And so I was like, it took me a couple of minutes of like the Eureka moment to say, how can I use the website that I've already built to create a solution for a problem that's clearly out there without doing the one thing that I will not do for feminine. So I do not ask for favors. Okay. When you're creating solutions around bias and, and, you know, minority anything or somebody that's like trying, you don't say to somebody, do this for me. It's not a personal thing. And so a lot of people who say, well, I'm going to do this for you. I'm saying, don't do it because it's the right thing. Do it because it's good for business. Do it because it's good for systems, but don't do me any favors, Mm -hmm. right? That's the wrong reason to do anything. Mm -hmm. So how did I do that? So we created this speakers bureau that was um, a searchable database for women speakers that had bios and you know all the demographic information you'd want for a grand round speaker. And then it gave them the place to put a video or an audio of them speaking, which meant that the person that was organizing the conference could vet them in the comfort of their home, have whatever judgment they wanted to have, and realize there's a lot of good women speakers out there, right? And then click the, you know, contact me button, which goes through me. And then I get to send all these notes to women in medicine saying, hey, this person wants you to speak, right? And what's funny about that is we saw an immediate uptick in women speakers. But more important than that, we have not had one single entirely man, entirely men speaker conference in emergency medicine since Mm. we made this public. And, you know, even if it gets close, we then we blast the Speakers Bureau out to people on Twitter or Facebook. So, you know, it allows it's it's all about like separating out like the solution for the bias from the person being biased against. So the speaker is like, if I wanted to be a speaker at a conference, I don't have to say, you know, choose me, choose me. I can say, have you seen the Feminine Speakers Bureau? I'm on it. Right. Whatever happens from there happens. Well, I was going to say, you know, I'm listening to everything that you're saying, like, in essence, you you started the show by saying change agent. Like you really are the epitome of a change agent. You're making changes based off of your actions. Have you ever considered like, do do people ever call you or characterize or do you characterize yourself as a social agent or excuse me, as a social activist? You know, it's funny. I I mean, I guess like, you know, it's like, I'm a connector. I'm a change. Mm -hmm. I'm a a catalyst, right? Like for things. Um, you know, that's, that's fun. That's where I get my energy from, but you can't be a catalyst if you're always the one that has to make the change. So a lot of the stuff I try to do, and I, I'm not always great at it, but I try to make sure that I do it is that it has to be sustainable beyond me. Right. right? That's a good point. Excellent point. Keep going. Yeah. Let's hear about this. So no, so, so the, the, the speakers bureau, as soon as I built it, and I mean, insofar as I imagined it, I had the web designer build it and then I had people help load. I, it now exists without me. Right. And so I can move on. Mm -hmm. 
You know, if I was only running the speakers bureau, then the thing that I'm really good at, which is identifying needs and trying to build systems that make solutions, I wouldn't be able to do the next thing. Right. And so we've had, I mean, another thing we did, and again, like we don't have, is we have this honor section on Feminem. What it is, is a place where people who get a women who get awards and honors can submit to us. And then we just make a post about an award a woman won because there's a bias against women celebrating their awards. Mm. Right. And so if, so if I tell you that I just won an award for best, I don't know, best dressed in my neighborhood or whatever mm. it's going to be, best innovator, best, whatever it's going to be, I don't care. Something as mundane as clothing, something as great as, as you know, discovering okay. the cure for cancer. No matter what the award is, if I tell you I won it, data shows that you have bias against me as being a, you know, against likability bias. You think I'm a bragger. You think that I'm trying to promote myself. Men mm-hmm. don't have that bias. We know that. So if we can create a space by which it's not the woman who's celebrating her accomplishment, but it's feminine Mm. celebrating their accomplishment and our amplification effect is even broader than the woman herself. So then we've created. So be mad at the system, not mad at the individual. Yeah. I mean, that's everything, right? Even with Eminem, right? With everything, right? It's about having a, a, a infrastructure that can absorb the backlash to move things forward. Right. Because I don't want any singular person to, to absorb that level of energy, all the hate and the you know trolls and all that stuff. Like, let me have it. And by that, I mean, let Feminem have it and leave these people alone. Now, do you still consider this? I mean, initially started off as a passion project. Like, when do you start to say, because there's going to be other people who want to do something either similar or they want to create something that takes a life of its own. When do you start to say, okay, this is no longer passion project. Like I officially, this is what I do, right? Like, (laughs) right. This is is what you do. Like talk to us about that. So in any, in the beginning of any project that's going to take your time and effort, it also takes your money. Okay. Whether it's the money that you invest in it or the money that you're not earning because you're doing it. Um, But there is an element of that. Your podcast costs you money. Yes, it does. Right. Yes, and if anybody wants to sponsor uh, this episode, please uh, write to Docs Outside the Box at. <laughs> no, go ahead. I think I have a sponsor for you, actually, for this episode. Let's talk. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, you know, basically, I, uh, you know, my husband is in finance and he's one of my best peer mentors, you know, whatever. And so he doesn't let me do anything for free because it costs him money. Right. Right. And so when I when I imagine feminine and I was gonna be a hobby, which is anti doctor, really, right? We don't really we're not trained to think like that. But, no, and right. he he's been saying this since the beginning of medicine, right? It's like you know he doesn't understand. I mean, he understands our motivation to be physicians, but and we're you know against society, we're highly compensated individuals. So don't wax, don't get so sad and cry for me as a, do- a person who doesn't get paid at all. Like there is there is a a, a reckoning against how much it costs us to become doctors and how much we get paid. But at the same time, on a standalone basis, we're not poor people, right? But at the same time, we we are used to working harder than our hourly compensation. So I think that's described pretty good. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, we're willing, like there's an unlimited, we, we work all 160, you know, eight hours in the week. We don't take nights and weekends. Like there's an unlimited amount of work we'll do for something. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I still do like to remember how privileged we are to be physicians, especially when we're talking about like women in medicine. Like, you know, there are plenty of women out there that have a lot more problems to solve than I do, which is why I think it's my responsibility to solve them for us all. Right. The single mom working at McDonald's, she does not have the leverage I do to say, you know, you can't take my job. You can't take my insurance. And I'm going to fight for a lactation room. Like, I know that that's my privilege. Thanks for bringing that perspective on. I, I really appreciate that. I think the listeners will appreciate that also. Yeah. No, I, and, and so I actually never forget that, to be honest. Uh, anyway, so having that said. I always knew that there was going to be like what the financial arc was feminine was going to be. So before I thought of it, I thought about how it was going to get funded. And that would be um, advertising that was mission-based because it's really a mission-based organization. Mm -hmm. So if institutions who were doing good policies for women wanted to celebrate their policies, we were going to be the place they were going to do it. And so if I created a culture and a community that was all of the women in emergency medicine in one place, I could tell people, you want to hire us? You tell us why. We are the workforce you need. Come in and you're going to pay us a little bit, like, because they pay for advertising already. So I was just using where people were spending money and I was using it to 
then justify the finances, the website. Excellent. When do you swap your hobby for your job is when you spend more time and effort on your hobby than your job. And that means that you, your hobby has to start paying you like your job or else you mm -hmm. can't swap. So um, a year ago, January of 2017, I went per diem at NYU. So I only work one to two shifts a week and I love emergency medicine. Um, it is like still a core vestige of, of what I am. Um, but I only need to work in the ER one or one day a week, maybe two. And then I don't have to work there other than that for the week. And I spend the rest of my time doing feminine. The financial um, opportunity really came from the conference. So just to mm -hmm. kind of tie the whole thing up, we did the website and then, you know, we generated some revenue. The website became revenue neutral very quickly, uh, but it was never going to pay enormous amounts of money and or my time because we're still doctors. And um, then like kind of serendipitously, uh, I realized that I wanted that I wanted to the energy that feminine had online and I wanted to put it into a conference that would empower the shit out of women and people that wanted to make change in their own community. Because as much as I could do on my scale, there is like, and, and a lot of it, I think, was the galvanizing effect of what happened in the election in 2016 and what, no, and what I needed people to do on the ground, right? Like I knew that women physicians needed to empower their voices and they needed to know how to write articles and op-eds and they needed to have be speakers and they needed to have a, you know, lead and they needed to lead their departments and they needed to advocate for healthcare. I mean, there was so much falling apart in a crash moment for what I perceived to be the needs of the people that I was connected to that I wanted them to feel like in like empowered and enraged and excited at the same time. So we decided we we're going to have a conference. And so we planned this conference. Uh, it was, it took us a year, October of 2017 in New York city it was 250 people. We called it the feminine idea exchange and we wanted to solve, discuss the issues surrounding women in medicine and gender equity. And we wanted to be inclusive. So 10% of our speakers were men, a fair number of our um, of our people were there that weren't physicians. They were medical students, EMTs, PAs, uh, mostly women physicians. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. I mean, it was like the single greatest thing I've ever created. And I've had three kids. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know offense they, to them. They don't listen to this podcast anyway, though, Well, right? no, so. they probably will because I'll listen to it in the car. <laughs> Another <laughs> podcast, mommy, really? Uh, no, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it was just like, I watched these women come in from around the world of this idea that I had that I could just ask them to believe in us. And that was, mm -hmm. I mean, other than the website, you can look at from your house, but these people like flew, you know, Ooh, exactly. And they move their bodies and nobody moves their bodies anymore. And so we basically, you know, in that room, it was magic, you know, and the speakers were diverse as diverse as I could get them to come for the first conference. And they were of from all different walks of life. And they were from, generationally spread out and they had accomplished so many random things and it felt good. And we knew we needed to do better for the next year, right? Immediately we started finding the holes, the problems that we had. And we started thinking about what could we do for, for next year for better. And so that's what we're doing for next year. We're going to do better. For um, Fix 18. For Fix 18. It's going to be bigger. So it's about 600 uh, people. It's going to be... Um, we just now have decided the speaker slate and I'm very excited about it. It's going to be announced th this week of the week we're recording. I don't know when it's going to be launched. Uh, but so by the time this is out, it will be out. Mm -hmm. Tickets will be on sale uh, March 1st of 2018. Um, and then the conference is October 16th through the 18th in New York City. Uh, and it is just going to be this very amazing opportunity for people of like mind to come together and, you know, celebrate what it is to be a physician. It's mostly emergency medicine doctors speaking, although not all. Um, it is not all women. Uh, it's not all doctors. Uh, it is. Uh, I, I, I think we've we've turned it up a notch this year. Uh, we had an incredible number of submissions, which is what I was saying before. Uh, we had hundreds of submissions for less than fifty spots. Oh wow! Uh, and everyone submitted a video and was thoughtful in their content. And so, you know, we're realizing that you know, and and with that, and the last thing is. Um, we launched our podcast. So we have our own feminine podcast. Yeah, I saw that. that. Yeah. So we, it happened. So with fix 17, which was amazing and it only had 250 spots, we wanted people to get the content, but we wanted to keep it like preserved at the moment. So we didn't want to make it so that you could watch the conference from far away. Then we wanted it to be a, like a very, like a space, you know? 
So what we decided to do was have a podcast that we launched December or January, I think December, that was all of the video and audio of the conference. We launch every Tuesday. We send out one, um, one lecture a week that is on the website as a video, but on the podcast as an audio. And you can listen to all the conference lectures. So by the end of, by June, we'll have released basically every lecture from 2017, just in time for the October of next year. And uh, so once we built the infrastructure for a podcast, we were like, oh, we have things we want to say. So we decided also to do a 30 minute podcast every Friday on some topic related to women in medicine. So we've discussed things like benevolent sexism and pay discrepancy and pay transparency. And yeah, I noticed that, you know, I saw the women... pay pay is a big issue that you guys focus on. Yeah. Well, pay is a big mm -hmm. issue for everyone, right? Like one of the things we've been discussing is, you know, and this goes back to kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? We've discussed, we've discovered a lot of things in gender disparity that we haven't discussed for race disparity because we haven't even done that research yet. So if you listen to our podcast on um, salary transparency and then the following article, which is on salary discrepancies in emergency medicine, the article we, we actually used was race and gender disparities in emergency medicine. But what's interesting is we know there's a significant salary discrepancy for gender. We couldn't publish that for race because the end of the number of like minority physicians that were studied was so low that it would remove the um, mm. anonymity of the study. So we know that the new studies that need to be done are on the salary discrepancies amongst racial, different racial groups or the salary discrepancies amongst racial groups and gender groups. Like how does that all which brings up out? another, which brings up another issue, which means if your population is not big enough from a race issue, that's another issue. You can't even, you don't even have enough power to do a study. Isn't that interesting? That's a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that so these are the things we talk about in the podcast. Right. Which is all these topics related to, you know, like I said, gender equity in emergency medicine or even in medicine um, that require a bit of a conversation because on the, you know, the tweets and the Facebook posts and even the blog posts don't allow the depth of curiosity and communication that is, you know, about calling women doctors. Right. Like the bias that occurs and it's unconscious so often when women physicians are not introduced as grand round speakers as often as men, when women physicians always introduce everybody as doctor, but men hardly do, right? That's a conversation we need to have. And so that's what we do with the podcast. And so mm. that's the empire. Okay. All right. <laughs> that we've created. Well, look, let's, let's, let's transition to some fast fire questions. I'm just going to ask you a question. You just tell me what is the quickest thing that comes to your mind. Don't think too hard about it. You ready to do this? I don't think too hard about anything. All right, let's do it. You girl from Brooklyn, let's do it. What's one thing you want people to learn from this podcast? That you can be a change agent. Love it. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you have given yourself as a pre-med? Take more time. Okay, all right. What's the biggest, let's do this. What's the biggest weakness of feminine? I don't have a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the biggest weakness? <sighs> I don't know. I don't have, I don't know. I actually don't know weakness yet uh, because I don't, it's not fixed. You know, it's not one thing. Mm -hmm. So it can't have, if there's a, if there are weaknesses, we evolve it. If you want to expand on it, go ahead. No, I, there, feminine isn't one thing. So it can't have one weakness, right? There are hurdles we have, right? So our ability, you know, old white men are our biggest hurdle. But I can't do anything about them. I'm trying, you know. They, there are so many people of power, and there are many, many, many younger ones who are our champions. But there are a lot of people who are fixed in their beliefs of what it is to be successful and who should be in power and what are the standards and the cultural norms. And those that getting them to understand our that we matter is actually really hard sometimes. That's the biggest hurdle feminine has, but that's not a weakness of feminine. Mm -hmm. You know I what I mean? You. Now, do you ever work? Do you, because obviously you want feminine to be, well, look, it's hard to have an organization that's everything to everybody, right? Do, do you yeah. ever, for example, with the hashtag me too uh, concept, the, uh, that, that movement that's going on, it's a very powerful uh, movement, but then there's still a little bit of some acrimony between women who have privilege and women of color. Like, do you see anything like that occurring in feminine at all? Do you see that occurring? Yes. Can you, can you yeah, so that's actually, that's a great okay. question. So uh, I will say that it is, so I am a liberal Democrat from New York City and many of our beliefs around gender equity 
tend to fall on the left, Mm -hmm. right? Yet there are many women on the right who are, you know, who are women in emergency medicine, who believe in equity, who want to be part of this and feel alienated. So I guess actually one of the biggest challenges we've actively tried to overcome, unlike the old guys in power, um, is trying to make sure that people who are of varied political beliefs uh, feel included. And actually that was one of the biggest revelations from FIX 17 that we're changing for FIX 18 is actually increasing the number of Mm -hmm. conservative speakers. So it was very, and you know, it's hard because we try to be inclusive, but that's not always how everyone feels. So the biggest issue obviously would be around the, you know, the aspect of choice, right? Like around, you know, reproductive rights for women and autonomy over your body. I personally have a feeling about that being a fundamental feminist principle, right? You can't have gender equity if you don't have equity or equality over your, the autonomy of your body. And that is why reproductive rights to me are, are a feminist issue. There are plenty of women who are in emergency medicine who don't believe, who are on the other mm-hmm. side of the coin when it comes to that. And so making Feminem a pro-choice organization, or at least somebody that is unapologetic about its support of choice, alienated some people. That was a choice I made. I I am the most important thing about what I've created. And I think one of the things I'm most proud of is that I am unapologetic about the commitment to the mission that Feminem was created to serve, which is to advance the cause of women in our specialty and to make it easier for women to stay at doctors, right? We spend so much time training to be physicians and the culture we're in creates an algorithm that makes it impossible sometimes for us to stay as physicians. And that includes reproductive autonomy. If I cannot choose when I have my children, my career in medicine does not have the same trajectory. Now, I can make whatever choice I want. Nobody says that I have to not have a baby if I get pregnant. But my autonomy as a physician and my career depends on my ability to make that choice for myself. Understood. Sorry, that's my soapbox. No, no, you don't have to apologize. This is Docs Outside the Box. Come on now. <laughs> I'm on the box right now. I'm not outside there you the go. box. Come on now. <laughs> well, what's what's one life hack that you use right now to either make your life easier or to stay more productive? Because you got a lot of things going on. Doctor, you know, uh, uh, founder, editor of Feminine, mom. Why? Like, how do you manage all of this stuff? Uh, I, I use a lot of organizational tactics. So things like Nirvana, which is a web-based list making service or my phone or, you know, I'm always plugged in. I, I turn on and turn off, but the hack I would say I use the most is um, cloud-based like services. So I can go in and out of what I need to do the mm-hmm. most. So Google Docs is a huge thing because every document I need is in the same space, regardless of what computer I'm doing it from. And that, that's been my hack for a long time, uh, I would say. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. Well, we're getting, well, we're at the end of the interview and I'm going to present to you a statement that I asked to all of my guests. It's hashtag, I'm not just a doc. And this is just a way for you to kind of describe who you are outside of just being a doctor. So Dr. Dara Cass, I present to you, I'm not just a doc. I'm a a creator. Love it. Love it. Well, look, you totally rocked this, uh, this uh, podcast. How about you come back on the show? Let's do it again sometime. I would love to. I I will tell you, I was so excited when you emailed me. Really? I did not think I made. Yeah, I. You have been doing an incredible thing, and I've been watching it. Thank um, you. you know, well, because you know, I started a podcast after I had a movement. You're starting a movement with a podcast. It's a Thank different you. thing. Thank you. Thank and you I very much. I respect it. So I'm honored to be here and glad to come back. Well, the goal is like you said, like you you felt as though at one point you were in an island. Um, I felt mm-hmm. as though I was an island with thoughts of, well, I, I'm more than just a doc. There's more to me than just this. And um, since starting this podcast, so many people have reached out to me. I've reached out to other people. And I just feel like there's, like you said, this movement community of doctors who are just saying, you know what, whatever it is that we're doing, we control the conversation, right? Um, whether it's for women, whether it's for minorities, whether it's for whoever it is, we control the conversation. And um, it's something that I think we all should take pride in. Because the one thing I did want to ask you about is, do you think that you would be as successful with feminine, feminine, excuse me, 10 years ago, or, you know, 20 years yeah. ago? No. Why so? Yeah. Um, so because culture is changing, 
right? So the first thing, uh, and this is, so without Facebook and Twitter and social media networks, I could not have galvanized as many people the way I did as I, as before. So that's one. So I could connect with an enormous number of people to guys like you. Okay. And I mean this honestly, right? So our culture is shifting. Our generation, generation of physicians, 35 to 45, who are now getting to be in charge are the ones that are going to help make this difference, right? I believe that in politics. I believe that in medicine. I believe that in the intersection of politics and medicine. And so I, I really do believe that, you know, the fact that we can talk about parental leave and that my peers are as de- devastated when they can't stay home with their new baby as, um, as other people. I mean, like I said, just to give you an example, right? On TV last month, Chris Hayes, you know who yes. he is? He hosts this. Yeah. So Chris Hayes took two weeks off when he had a new baby, right? On TV, in front of everyone. And every night that Joy Reid was on a show, I was like, good mm-hmm. for Chris, right? And I like her. But at the end of the day, like- yeah, She doesn't play on her loud. show. Like she takes people she to task awesome. on her show. <laughs> Don't come with no cor- incorrect no, information or talking points. <laughs> I'm sorry to right. cut you off. So I love her. But, it, but she represented the idea that Chris was home with his kid for two weeks. Instead of being on TV- right? Our generation is going to change things. And that's why I say that the time, that, that's why the time is now. The, it wasn't going to happen years ago. It is going to happen now. We just have to survive the next few years. Boom. Mic drop. Dr. Dara Cass, this was fun. Thank you, Nick. This, I, think this is just part, I, I think this is just part one. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll this, take that. this was a great time. We're going to have to do it again. Okay. okay. Talk to Thanks you for being on the show. Once again, I want to thank Dr. Dara Cass for coming on Docs Outside the Box and keeping it 100 on the show. I really had a good time with her, and I hope you all can feel her energy, can feel her passion. It really, I mean, it really does say a lot about building something from the ground up and then seeing it flourish and seeing how and how much it means to other people and for her specifically to you know really talk about having a conference and having people from all over the country and pretty much the world come to her conference that had to be such a gratifying experience so i i really learned a lot so i hope you all got a lot out of that also to learn more about dr darakas please check out feminem's website at fem and m that's spelled f e m is in mary i n is in nancy E-M is in Mary dot O-R-G. I know it's a little bit of a tongue twister. And then on Twitter, you can follow her at Dara Cass. That's at D as in dog, A-R-A-K-A-S-S. And then you can also get involved with Feminem with their Facebook group. I put the links in the show notes. So look, I'm going to catch you guys on the next episode. But remember, before I jet, we only got one life. Let's make it count and live outside the box. Peace.